Hello, ladies and gents. Welcome to episode 17 of the Diva Walk Show, where it is my job to interview professional and collegiate soccer players about their life journeys around the beautiful game. On this episode, I speak with Matt Fries, a professional soccer player for New York CFC. Amongst other things, we talk about his experience getting a trial at Liverpool and Manchester United, winning the 2020 Supporters Shield with the Philadelphia Union, getting called up to the U.S. national team, and getting to play against the likes of Lionel Messi and Luis Suarez. I really enjoyed this super engaging and insightful episode, and I hope you do too. Matt, welcome to the show. Thanks for joining me, man. Excited for this conversation. Yeah, of course. Thanks for having me. I'm looking forward to it. Okay, before we get into introductions, I want to congratulate you on your recent tie. So you guys recently played Inter Miami. You had an amazing game, one man in the match, and then followed that up with uh, making the MLS Team of the Week. Uh, so first of all, congrats on on that great achievement. Thanks. Yeah, it was uh, it was a it was a tough game for sure. It's always crazy playing down there, to be honest. <laughs> yeah, I saw I saw the highlights, and you know, yet I think three out of the five saves you had were against Luis Suarez, and one of them was one v one. So that was that was quite impressive. Thank you very much. Yeah, it was cool. Cool experience for sure. Let's get into introduction. So tell us your full name, where you're from, and an interesting fact about you. Okay. So my name is Matt Fries. Um, I'm from all over, kind of. I lived in Philadelphia for most of my childhood, but also lived in Minnesota and lived in South Carolina for a while. And then uh, if you can't tell with my freckles, I'm, I'm <laughs> Irish by blood and German and French, so kind of from all over. And then um, interesting fact about me. Wow. Um, interesting fact would be that I like to, I'll, I'll give two. Um, I like, uh, I like dancing. I'm not a good dancer, <laughs> but I enjoy dancing. Uh, and then uh, I play a bunch of instruments. I play guitar, drums, piano, and uh, play the violin growing up. Nice. When did you start playing soccer and who got you started with the sport and why did you decide to become a goalkeeper? Uh, kind of all answered by the same, this, the, you know, one story. Um, when I lived in South Carolina, I was about eight or nine, probably seven or eight. And um, my neighbor, who was kind of like my role model, he was just like the, the really awesome, um, well-rounded guy. Uh, everyone loved him in his high school. He's just a really nice guy. And really successful. And he was the goalie on the high school soccer team. Uh, and South Carolina is pretty, um, what's the word? They're not the most advanced soccer wise. So like there weren't academies or anything like that. Like the high school team was what everyone did. So he was, you know, the, the, the best, uh, soccer athlete I knew around and he kind of, he, he sparked my interest in the sport and he was a goalie. So that's kind of why I started playing goalie. I think, being a goalkeeper is probably the hardest position to play in. And I think it's probably the most important if I had to pick a, a position and probably underappreciated because I tried it once when I was younger and I was like, this is not for me. It was a bit scary. And um, so you guys are definitely built a little bit different and you guys do a lot. I think sometimes maybe it goes underappreciated. Yeah, I understand what you're saying. I think, I don't know about maybe most important because I think everyone's important on the field, but you hit it spot on. It's a scary position. You have a lot of pressure. Um, there's not really many upsides to being a goalkeeper. There's only a downside. Like you don't really get recognition when you win. And then when you lose, it's always your fault. So you have to be a little bit crazy to play a uh, goalkeeper <laughs> for sure. Exactly. I, I totally agree there. So while you were growing up, you had the opportunity to train with some top teams in England, right? Liverpool, Manchester United, as well as Bournemouth. How did that opportunity come about and what was your experience training with them? Yeah, so when I was 17, I had just joined the the Philadelphia Union Academy. I played a bunch of other sports growing up, so I was never able to really be on an academy team. And then, you know, I, I decided soccer was the sport I wanted to stick with when I was around 17. So I joined the academy there and um, I got called up to the U19 national team. And uh, from there, a bunch of, uh, you know, some some European scouts were there and were interested in me. And so I went over uh, to Manchester United uh, in 2016 um, to, you know, to train with them, go on trial, etc. cetera. Um, I actually didn't know that it, it was a trial. I wasn't well-versed in soccer language. Like I thought this was like 
I was going there for a cool experience to train with them. I didn't know that they were actually considering, you know, trying yeah. to sign me. I, I thought it was so far off of that level and um, I had no idea. And then, you know, I got there and I played well. Um, and after the first few days, I was like, wait, maybe they're, you know, maybe they're looking at me. And then I had to kind of decide between going the European route uh, and joining one of their reserve team setups um, at, a, at a young age to eventually hopefully be on the first team. And it was either that or, um, you know, stay in the MLS, um, pursue my degree and all that. And so I, I ultimately decided with the latter uh, for a bunch of reasons. I, I thought um, I thought the league was growing at a honestly un- unprecedented rate. And I think that's, mm-hmm. you know, fortunately it has happened the way I thought it would. Um, and it's really grown over these last, you know, five to 10 years. And being a part of that is amazing. And, um, you know, being exposed to first team uh, level soccer football right away is is really important for your growth. So um, that's kind of ultimately, you know, what decided it for me. Yeah, no, that's quite the experience at such a young age. Um, I think I read somewhere that some of the England, like full goalkeepers were there uh, during that trial. Yeah. So Dean Henderson, who's now the the keeper for Crystal Palace, he was, he was my age and um, we were like training partners kind of throughout that, mm-hmm. you know, that whatever three week process. Um, so that was really great to learn from him. I mean, we we're the same age, but in terms of soccer or football experience, it's not even close. He was so far ahead of me <laughs> at that point. Um, I was, you know, three months into an academy. Um, I still ran track from my high school track team. Like I was very far off of his level of experience. So getting to learn with and from him was amazing. And, um, and he's doing really well now. And then um, Mark Travers was at Bournemouth when I was there. And Aaron Ramsdale was at Bournemouth when I was there. So I was training alongside them. They're both doing really well right now. Mark's not playing as much, but Aaron's obviously um, really shot up over the last few years. So yeah, it's real, it, was, it was a really cool experience for sure. Wow, that, that's incredible experience there. And you alluded to this earlier, but you came through the ranks at Philadelphia Union, um, where you eventually signed a homegrown contract. Uh, talk to us about your experience there and what that program did in terms of your development. So the academy there is, is an unbelievable setup. The ownership group kind of wanted to be one of the first movers in that market of really growing young players, um, giving them a full immersive experience where they eat, drink, breathe soccer. Um, they're going to school on the side and and obviously fulfilling all their requirements that way so that they can, you know, if they decide to go to college, they can they can go to that route. Um, but it was really great to be able to have the access to that training environment. And the coaching staff there was, was awesome, the academy staff. Um, I'm still close with the academy coaches. And, um, you know, the bond that that academy team had was really strong just because you knew you were kind of the only one of two or three teams in the entire country who are doing this where you're living together and, and training every single day wow yeah no that sounds super impressive in terms of just developing you as a player and as a person so after the academy you decided to go to harvard where you spent a couple of seasons before ultimately deciding to go professional talk to us about your experience at harvard and your thought process as you made that decision to leave early and go professional the decision to go was um First of all, definitely a, a wish that my parents wanted, um, which is understandable, um, as well as myself. You know, I, I wanted to try college out and I wanted to see what it was like and, and live on my own and grow personally as well as, um, you know, academically, obviously. It's it's an amazing experience and it's an honor um, to have gone there. So um, I did my first semester there and then uh, kind of reevaluated the soccer end of things and what my goals were. And after the first semester, I kind of decided with my parents, I would be leaving early. Um, The question Mm -hmm. was when, uh, you know, should I do it right after that first semester or give it another year, get 15 to 20 games under my belt, um, you know, guaranteed playing rather than becoming a pro where you might not be able to play games and uh, you're just training. And so um, I did that. uh, And then after that sophomore fall, so after three semesters, and midway through sophomore fall, I, I ended up leaving. No, that, that makes sense. Um, and it looked like it worked out for you because, uh, as you mentioned, being a goalkeeper is like 
you really sub somebody, right? So unless you're the first goalkeeper, it's kind of tough to get playing time and to be able to get the experience in college, I'm sure it helped you in your development. Uh, so being able to represent your country at the international stage is considered to be one of the highest honors for many professional soccer players. You've been called up to both the the youth and the senior national team levels for the U.S. What has that experience been like for you and what has it meant to represent the U.S.? Yeah, I mean, representing the U.S. is, is an amazing honor and, and it's something that, like, I never realized what it meant um, and how, um, just how much it means uh, until it kind of happens. And then um, when it happened, I, I got called in um, to a senior team camp and an Olympic team camp my rookie season in, in Philadelphia um, or a combined camp, I forget, but uh, I was injured. So I was unable to go and that was devastating for me. And then um, got called in again towards the end of that season. And uh, you know, kind of after that, I was with the Olympic group uh, for the next two years as we prepared for qualifiers and then went to qualifiers and then got postponed through COVID and then went to the second round of qualifiers after um, it got, you know, restarted back up again. Yeah, COVID. I remember I was still in college during COVID and I thought like everybody else, it was going to be like a, you know, a couple of months thing by the summer when it got hotter, things would be back to normal. But then season got canceled, the following year got canceled. So yeah. it was a hectic time for sure. We were in Mexico for for the Olympic qualifying, you know, rounds. Um I think we were in Mexico City, I believe, or Guadalajara, and uh, and all of a sudden, uh, the first game was was the next day, and then all of a sudden, uh, the NBA shuts down. We're at dinner, like you know, eating our pasta, getting ready for the game, and and everyone's looking at their phones, like, uh oh. And then, like an hour later, we get a, you know we get called down to the hotel lobby, and it's like this is all shut down. Everyone's on a flight first wow. thing tomorrow morning to get back into the U.S. It was crazy insane that's insane um and it feels like ages now um but i'm happy we're past that uh as i was doing research for this episode i came across an article in which you referenced the popular saying that uh pressure makes diamonds and i think your full debut perfectly describes that uh, you made your first start during the last game of the 2022 season stepping in for the injured andre blake to help the team win the supporters shield for the first time in club history and to be thrown into the starting lineup in a season-defining game at a young age is definitely uh, a lot of pressure, uh, to say the least. So talk to us about that game and what it meant for you uh, and your family. Yeah, that was, um, I think it was actually 2020. It was right at, you know, right during COVID. And, and it was obviously a tough year for the entire world. Um, and it was, uh, you know, for me, from a soccer perspective, it was, uh, pretty brutal because we went to Orlando for two months living in a hotel, couldn't leave the hotel except for training. And, and that was obviously not really fun. And so, and at that point I was, you know, number three or four on the depth chart. Uh, and I wasn't getting obviously game time, but I wasn't even on the bench for games. And so it was a, like you're saying, a, the pressure makes diamonds and, and all that. Uh, I'll get to the answer at the end of this. Um, the reason why that game at the end of the season was so meaningful for me is because I, throughout that two month period and, and, and for the following three, four months when I wasn't even on the bench, um, mm -hmm. my mindset was just to grow from it and make the most of it. And, and instead of being upset that I wasn't on the bench, I would go to the gym and, and work out or go train. And, and that year was probably the most hours and the most effort I've, I've put into anything, uh, in, in my life. Um, despite kind of the unfortunate circumstances of, of, of being that far down the depth chart. And then yeah. uh, when Andre got hurt and, and they said it was my, you know, my time to go it was something that like, I wasn't too nervous because at that point I was like, literally I, I have done everything I can. And I thought like the nerves and uh, anxiousness, anxiety leading into a game comes from like, the, the concept of, of maybe I'm not prepared enough, but I knew mm. that if I was ever going to be prepared for a moment, I was prepared at that point. Cause uh, like I said, that, that year prior, I had spent so much effort, so much time. Um, and so that game was really for me, like a, a karmic reward for working so hard. Um, yeah. Obviously I wish Andre had never gotten hurt because you never wish upon your teammate, but um 
that's kind of the way it shook out and you know karma helped me out <laughs> yeah yeah i was unbelievable to be able to help the club win their first you know supporter shield in the club's history is, is quite impressive and to be able to do in your first full start is, is quite an accomplishment so really happy to hear that for you um and it, you know it looked like it's well well deserved um getting into harvard is really hard right only a small percentage of people get into harvard you know becoming a professional athlete is also really hard you managed to be able to do both of those so as you reflect on your journey so far what characteristics or habits would you say have helped you get to where you are and what could others looking to maybe emulate or learn from your experiences um take away from your story uh yeah definitely so i would say as far as characteristics stuff i've learned is you just have to outwork whoever you're competing against um the old saying of hard work beats talent when talent doesn't work hard it's for sure the most true adage in the, in the book and so um characteristic wise i would say that's the most important on the academic and the sports side is is just um you know outworking whoever you're competing against um and, and also the other part that for me is more valuable is um and this is something soccer has taught me um is is finding ways to add value um and increase your stock even in kind of tangential or um you know secondary ways so for example for me um something that i've always added to my soccer game is the is the team culture building and the teamwork and and the uh, chemistry building leader that i want to be and um you know that that applies mainly for the soccer aspect but um that's definitely added to my stock and part of the reason that you know whether it's scouts or coaches or teammates have been interested in me and helped me along is because they know that i've you know at all points put the team first and uh, you know, helped the team grow, even if I'm not playing or even if I'm hurt, you know, help the team in that way. No, super insightful and appreciate that advice there. Uh, as you look over your, you know, relatively young career so far, what do you say has been the highlight? The highlight? Um, I would say the highlight for me is is just... I would say probably that supporter shield game, just because it was so meaningful for me to come from such a, you know, a difficult few months in the season prior, I had a bunch of injuries and I had a bunch of, you know, stuff, personal stuff that I had to work on to help me in the soccer world. And so um, that game, like I mentioned earlier, is just a really meaningful karmic reward for everything that I'd done prior. So that was probably the best part of my career so far. Nice. Uh, on the flip side, what would you say has been the low light of your soccer journey so far? The low point of the journey would probably be the second round of Olympic qualifiers. Um, as I mentioned earlier, the first round got delayed or canceled because of COVID. And then a year later, we came back. Um, in the first go around, nothing was official, but I think I might have been the starter at a you know good few months leading up to it. And, and played most of the games and started most of the games for the team leading up to it. And then the second time around, I had pretty much not played a first team MLS game in, in almost a year at that point. And so um, I wasn't the starter the second time around. And uh, that was, you know, that hurt. Um, but again, going back to what I just mentioned, um, I wanted to add value in other ways and and find ways to still impact the team. And so I was the one giving the um, the speech and the prayer uh, in our team huddle in the locker room before the game. Uh, and I was trying to just be as good of a teammate as possible to kind of lift everyone else up because in the end of the day, you know, I, I wanted to be an Olympian regardless of if I was the starter or not. So I, I wanted to help the team uh, get there as much as possible. Yeah, no, that's, that's super dope. I mean, I think definitely the, the right approach there, right? being the best teammate you can be, even when circumstances aren't ideal. And I guess, how do you, I guess, manage that, right? Where, you know, things happen outside of control. Like, so COVID came, right? That impacted that season. And then, you know, not being able to get minutes, given that you were, you know, a rookie, also impacted the, the tournament and your ability to be the starting lineup. How do you navigate things that are outside of control and, like, remain focused and, and be willing to work hard despite those things? That's a tough thing for a professional athlete because there are so many things out of your control. And, 
Um, there are high, high level decision maker type of things that are just out of the control of an individual athlete. Um, you know, whether it be uh, a team isn't performing well and, and you're stuck on that, you know, you're with that team, but the team is not performing well because the ownership group isn't willing to spend or um, your team is doing so well, uh, but you're not getting enough playing time and they're and the GM doesn't want to let you go because you're, you know, you're a low, low cost on the budget um, all the way down to, you know, as a goalkeeper, sometimes, uh, you know, you can't control if some world-class goals are scored on you, you, you know, it's just out of your control. And so uh, as a professional athlete, things are always, a lot of things are always out of your control. And um, to answer your question, directly there's no secret formula for uh, focusing on the things that are in, in your control because um you know it's it's something that everyone still battles with even the top top guys um it's tough to to perfect that skill okay i, I can imagine so this is gonna be the last question for me before we transition to the next segment of the podcast um I guess you're in your second season at, at NYCFC right now right you just cemented your spot as the starting goalkeeper what has your experience been um, over the last two seasons at NYCFC? Um, and I guess what are some of your goals for this season and, you know, for your future careers as well? Uh, yeah, the, the last, this past season and a half in New York has been fantastic. The organization's awesome and um, really cares about developing players and, and their model is fantastic. It's a very European style of playing. Um, so that's great because I've been exposed to, you know, a new skill set that I need as a goalkeeper and one that I hadn't previously learned in my, in my first 24 years of life. And so, um, it's been fantastic. And as far as goal setting, I think from a team perspective, the, the goal, the expectation for us, you know, our, our expectation for ourselves is to, is to make the playoffs. Uh, and then the goal I would say is to be a top four seed, uh, and cement that, that home, home field advantage for the first round, um, that's massive. And, um, from a personal level, um, I would say at some point in my career, a, a goal would be to be an all-star. I think that would be such an honor and really, really awesome. And, um, as far as this specific season, I don't, you know, I want to play as well as I can and put myself in that position. I don't know how realistic it is. It's my first season. So, um, the other goal that I had was to be a top five goals against average in the league. Mm. Uh, and so I think that's probably one of the more tangible, um, numerical objective attainable things that, that we're looking at as a defense right now. Okay. No, that makes sense. And you're doing well in the first, you guys played five games so far, right? Five or six games? Six. six yeah. You played well in all those games. And so I'm sure it will hopefully it'll happen this season or if not, if not the next season. Um, we're going to transition to the next segment of the podcast where I ask all my guests these similar type questions. Uh, so the first question is best player you ever played with? Best player I ever played with. I would have to go with uh, Andre Blake, the goalkeeper in, in Philly. Um, I mean, I've, you know, I've, I've played with so many people, but he, has really separated himself over the last eight years as, um, in my eyes, probably the best goalkeeper to ever be in the MLS. Um, at you know at the point of of him being in the MLS, obviously there's a bunch of other famous names: Hugo Lloris and uh, Berkey and Tim Howard, and and the list goes on and on of of people who um, were incredible and and um, also played in the MLS. But as far as while he's in the MLS, um, I, you know, I, I would say Andre has really separated himself. He's, he's unbelievable. That makes sense. Has anybody won more than three times like goalkeeper of the year? No, he's the only one who's won it more than twice. Oh, wow. That's impressive. Uh, on the flip side, best play you ever played against? I think I know the answer to this one. This is, a, this is an easy one. <laughs> <laughs> uh, played against Messi last year in, in November. Um, yeah, that's a that's the easy one. There's not much to be said about it. <laughs> yeah, I saw that coming in. You had a great game too. I think you had like three or four saves against him specifically, which was quite impressive. Yeah, it was cool. A really cool experience. Uh, last question for you: uh, Messi or Ronaldo? I'm a Messi guy, actually. Um, I don't know. I feel like maybe the debate 
his last two years has actually trended towards Messi. Am I right about that? Yeah, yeah, you're definitely right about that, yeah. I think kind of like globally it's trended towards Messi. Um, but obviously for 15, 16 years they were um, going back and forth. And so I just think the way Messi uh, impacts his team, he's the best to ever do it. Um, when you when you tally up the assists plus the goals, the way he uh, you know sees the game and um, and how he deals with being honestly a, a pretty small player uh, in stature, um, he's able to muscle other everyone who's bigger off the ball, and it's just like it just doesn't make sense. <laughs> it's it's such an amazing skill that he has. It's a, it's quite impressive, and it's funny. I usually actually be a Ronaldo fan. Like I'm still a Ronaldo fan, but for the longest time I convinced myself that Ronaldo was the better player. I think I always knew deep down that he wasn't. I just wanted to argue my siblings. I, I just think he's more, he's more, he's more marketable. And, um, you know, he's, he's the goal scorer all the time. And yeah, yeah. You know, he's the position that gets all the glory. And so um, from a, from a fame standpoint, I understand why everyone, you know, so many people thought it was him. Yeah, for sure. Um, really enjoyed this conversation for those looking to follow your journey. Where can they find you? Uh, uh, I live in Hoboken. If you if you want to find me here, <laughs> no, I'm kidding. Uh, my my Instagram is Matty Ice Freeze. Um, that's probably the best way to you know stay up to date and, and stay connected. Great. Uh, thank you very much for the time. I really enjoyed this conversation and look forward to watching your journey uh, this season. Thanks. Yeah, I really appreciate it. Thanks for taking the time out of your day to listen and support this podcast. It is very much appreciated. Please follow the show if you don't already do so. The show can be found on YouTube, Instagram, TikTok, and the rest of the other major platforms. As always, be kind to yourself, be kind to others. Much love. This show is produced by Yak Awak and original music by Scott Holmes.